Hey, scholars, this is Dr. King Owen coming at you with a shortened version of lecture 13. This lecture is titled Union Breakdown. It is a survey of the 1850s and the events of the 1850s that led us into the Civil War. Before we begin, let me ask you to put aside for just a moment the knowledge of the fact that the Civil War is coming. If you want to think about this decade through the eyes of the people that lived it, you have to remember they don't know what's coming yet. But they are watching the breaking apart of the United States over a 10 year period. So let's go with this lecture 13 short version and start with Theme number one, the breakdown of party, or I really should say the breakdown of institutions that held the United States together. The debates over slavery that we started examining in the last unit, slavery expanding to the West, uh, slavery's effect on the politics of the United States Congress, gag rule, doe faces, uh, slave power, conspiracy, all that stuff, starts to tear apart the second party system, the system of Whigs and Democrats that had been in operation since the time of Andrew Jackson. So as the issues of slavery and its expansion of the West are increasing tensions in the United States, the political system cannot hold together and it especially cannot hold together across the sectional lines. We start to see Southern Whigs in the 1850s abandoning the Whig Party and voting Democrat and saying that they do not feel like the Whig Party is going to protect the, the interests of Southerners. And so they stop thinking in national terms and are thinking more in regional terms, sectional terms. Uh, for a moment, the Northern Whigs uh, get distracted. Um, by a development that is really a recurrence of nativism or a fear over foreign influence and immigrants in the United States. Um, and this is because in the 1840s or early 1850s, the increase of population of people from Ireland, from Germany and Northern cities is really getting the attention of Northerners. And so for a moment, um, Northern voters are sort of distracted squirrel um, and the distraction for them is these migrating peoples from Europe. We don't like them. They're threatening to destroy American uh, politics as we know it. And so there is a brief party that pops up called the Know Nothings, which started out as a secret society um, and of course, uh, their response to being asked questions about it was to say, I know nothing. So that gave them their nickname. Um, they had several different names as they competed in elections in the mid 1850s. Uh, primarily, their support was in the North. You do see some of them in the South as well. And they are peddling on the fears of Catholics. Ah, Catholics threat to American religious uh, Protestantism peddling on the idea of foreign influence. These dangerous foreigners are taking over our cities and our politics. And of course, they're attaching a lot of this to um, the temperance movement. So not only are these foreigners dangerous, they're drunkards too. So it's king alcohol is a threat to Northern life. What happens is both of these trends, Southerners defecting from the Whig Party, Northerners defecting from the Whig Party, kills the Whig Party. And by the mid 1850s, the Whigs are no more. And we see the birth of a new party, the Republicans. Republicans are the heirs of the Free Soilers. Um, so their core political belief is no slavery expanding to the West. 
We need free soil, free labor, and free men. So we got to keep the West free for white folks. So former Whigs, anti-slavery Northern Democrats, liberty folks, free soil folks, all come together in this new party, which is geared around the idea of free labor. So the working class people of the North, middle class, Protestant values, so cult of domesticity and all those middle class northern things that were created way back in the market revolution, and very pro-business. Um, so they see the way of the future as commerce and business. Um, southerners are backwards. Slavery is backwards. That is not the way of the future. The Republicans are a distinctly sectional party very much rooted and cemented in the North. So as the system starts pulling apart, you get very much a Southern Democratic Party committed to slavery, a Northern Party committed to anti-slavery, and that's gonna set us up for really bad things by 1860. The threat of immigrants. Oh, this is a recurring theme in American history. You know, way back in the Alien and Sedition Acts of uh, 1798, the fear of foreign influence. Uh, so it's a recurring problem in American history to fear um, outsiders. We call that xenophobia. Um, there is a demographic reason for this fear in the sense that there is a massive population boom of foreign migrants between 1840 and 1850, uh, particularly Irish and German migrants seeking new opportunities in America, opportunities in the factories, um, northern cities. Um, they're certainly not going to the south because there's no real opportunity there. Um, and so this is a large jump. You can see here just the size of the numbers that we're talking about. This is a massive number of people to show up in the US. And of course, that kind of demographic change inspires a lot of nervousness and anxiety about the future. The ideal knowing nothing citizen. Oh, look here. This is a citizen, according to this image here. Um, this is a very romantic sort of image, um, kind of quintessential late 1840s, early 1850s. He's supposed to look intelligent. Look at this brow here, this forehead. Um, he's got a face that says, I'm white and Protestant and proud. Um, there was even know-nothing music. This is the know-nothing polka uh, dedicated to everybody by nobody. Our second theme is the development of a distinct anti-slavery sentiment in the North. Notice I say anti-slavery and not pro-African American because those are two different things. Northerners had up to about 1850 really kind of ignored anti-slavery politics. Remember abolitionists are a minority. They're not liked. Only about 10,000 full-time committed abolitionists. But then the Fugitive Slave Act changes everything by forcing Northerners to suddenly now be slave catchers. It takes the institution of slavery and it just shoves it in Northern faces in a way that hadn't been done so before. And now many Northerners are having a crisis of conscience. Do I support this law that says I must help catch runaways? Or do I absolutely reject this imposition from Southerners in my way of life, in my conscience, in my Northern existence. Many Northern states enacted personal liberty laws to nullify the Fugitive Slave Act. So they're doing exactly what Southerners would have done, say in 1798 or 1832. Um, so it's an interesting bit of role reversal, Northerners acting the role of nullifiers. And these personal liberty laws were designed to say to Northerners, you can reject this Fugitive Slave Act. You don't have to get out there and help catch these runaways. Adding fuel to the fire is Harriet Beecher Stowe. 
um, famous family of writers and religious leaders in America, the Beechers. And um, among them, of course, is uh, Catherine, who's one of the architects of the cult of domesticity in her own special way. Harriet had been living in Cincinnati, um, so just across the river from um, enslaved Kentucky, and had direct experience with runaways and knew of the plight of runaways, and she decided to write about it. Um, it came out in a serial uh, form in newspapers, so you get like a chapter a week, and of course people are like, oh, episode one was so thrilling, I can't wait for episode two. So they are drawn into this story of a runaway slave girl who is fleeing these evil Southern men who are bound and determined to catch this poor young mother as she runs across the frigid waters of the Ohio River to freedom. Um, the fact that this um, has a lot of illustrations, full page illustrations, makes it a very popular book as it heightens an empathetic portrayal of runaways and causes Northerners to suddenly be caught up in the story of slavery and escaped slaves from a, a more sympathetic point of view, more empathetic point of view. So Harriet Beecher Stowe deliberately, you know, catapults her fame on the back of the Fugitive Slave Act utilizing her knowledge and her experience with runaways. Um, it's quite popular um, and it runs right along with themes that had already been in existence for many Northerners. The idea of the slave power conspiracy, the, the belief that Southerners are able to dominate politics in the United States, they're able to silence discussions about slavery, they're able to gurg Northerners. Um, so you add in Stowe's work um, to the slave power belief, this belief that slavery is expanding relentlessly to the West and robbing Northerners of the opportunity to go West and make something of themselves. All of these come together to create a distinct vision of slavery as a threat to uh, Northern progress, to American progress. By 1860, we can see the organization of these anti-slavery Northerners in a group of young men known as the Wide Awakes. Wide Awake clubs um, formed throughout the North, perhaps something like 500,000 members of young men who marched um, in support of the Republican Party in support of Abraham Lincoln and opposed the slave power and its insidious threat to Northern freedom and liberty. The plight of runaways to the North certainly captured Northerners' attention, especially when it was understood very clearly that anybody captured and returned to the South had no right to defend themselves. So the Fugitive Slave Act in many ways was legalized kidnapping of random African-Americans off Northern streets. Um, these famous instances like the case of Anthony Burns uh, dovetailed along with abolitionists calling on Northerners to be careful, um, watch out people of the North, don't talk to police officers, don't wa uh, talk to the watchmen, because they could be kidnappers. They could actually be um, in process of like taking you to the South and you might lose your liberty and your freedom and the folks that you knew up North might never see you again. It actually happened here in Columbus. Um, there was a famous African-American bartender um, who was taken to Kentucky and the citizens of Columbus um, tried to institute a lawsuit to get him back and that failed and then they bought him um, to bring him back to town. Unfortunately, he died not too long after. And so those kinds of stories would heighten Northerners' hatred of what the Southerners are doing under the Fugitive Slave Act. 
Here is Harriet Beecher Stowe and uh, her title page from Uncle Tom's Cabin from the 1853 edition. It quickly sold hundreds of thousands of copies, uh, was turned into stage productions and toured the North, toured internationally. Um, it was quite the sensation, um, gripping, it would have been gripping television had television been in existence at the time. Here you can see uh, a production of Uncle Tom's Cabin, um, the Jarrett and Palmer London Company and the Slavin American troupe together to portray this runaway girl escaping the horrors of, and the evils of slavery um, as she carries her baby across the frigid waters of the Ohio River. A baby that actually kind of looks a little bit like Voldemort. It's not the best drawing ever. But it made for gripping theater for Northerners, and suddenly many Northerners were starting to care about the impact of slavery in ways that they had not before. Wide Awakes um, were quite popular in the North among young men. Um, particular uniform, you can see they're all wearing a particular kind of cap, uh, a cloak and they carry torches um, to symbolize their uh, wide awake nature, the bringing the light, supporting the Republicans and Lincoln through uh, street parades. They almost were kind of a paramilitary force uh, and their organization of them actually would prove to be quite useful at the opening of the Civil War since many of them just went into military service. Here is the wide awake. You can see the distinctive cape and uniform, the light he carries with his little lantern. Um, this is the wide awake quick step. Uh, so, you know, be ready, be awake. Um, this is a fun little piece, um, not particularly musically exciting. If I get some time, I might play it for you and attach it to this lecture so you can hear it. Our third theme of the 1850s, not only was the system breaking apart, not only were Northerners developing a distinct anti-slavery point of view, Southerners were becoming more aggressive in their protection and promotion of slavery. At one point, Southerners had argued that the federal government should stay out of the issue of slavery. They were actually afraid that if the federal government got involved, it might act in ways to hurt their um, beloved system of enslavement of human beings. But by the 1850s, you see more and more Southerners arguing that the federal government should protect slavery, that it should encourage and you know, make sure that slavery is existing, not just in the South, but in the West, and anywhere else that slavery happens to expand to. Good example of the aggressiveness of Southerners is Kansas, Nebraska, um, a territory that is organized in 1854 um, under the idea that the voters of Kansas would vote whether to have slavery or not. So they would rely on popular sovereignty to select slavery or freedom for the future of Kansas. Pro-slavery Southerners flooded into Canva, Kansas, not Canvas, um, flooded into Kansas and were noted for fraud and violence in their attempts to make Kansas a pro-slavery state. The fraud and violence uh, was so excessive that Kansas got nicknamed Bleeding Kansas. And in fact, the fighting spilled over into Congress when a congressman from South Carolina actually attacked a Northern Senator over the issue of slavery in 1856, walked in and wailed on this Northern Senator with his cane. Um, this was known as the Brooks Sumner Affair, which had basically originated out of a pretty heated fight over the future of Kansas. The Southern congressman beat the Northerner unconscious. The Northerner took about three years to recover. And, um, and 
the Southerner returned to South Carolina, resigned his seat in Congress. People mailed him canes as replacements that said, hit him again. But then um, I guess karma stepped in and the Southerner died of the croup not too long after this incident. Not only were Southerners violent in Kansas, violent on the floor of Congress, but they had violently expansionist plans for outside of the United States. Um, in 1854, they promoted a plan to seize Cuba. That is, if Spain would not sell Cuba, the U.S. should be prepared to invade and take it for the expansion of slavery. And one Southerner took this idea so, so deeply to heart that he personally invaded Nicaragua, not once, but in three occasions in order to try to turn Nicaragua into an extension of the South. Uh, finally, in the last attempt, um, William Walker was executed by a Nicaraguan firing squad. The last aggressiveness that we see of Southerners comes in the form of a court case, Dred Scott versus Sanford, 1857, in which an African-American man living on free soil asks a really important question. Does living in free soil make me a free person? That is, can I be enslaved if I'm in an area where slavery is not allowed? The Supreme Court took up the case and they decided decisively for the South that not only does living on free soil not make you free? Enslaved people were never intended to be citizens, so shut up, Dred Scott, and take a seat because you're not even a citizen of the United States. They didn't stop there, though. The Dred Scott decision went further to argue that um, any prevention of slavery in any place in the United States is essentially not constitutional. And this was derived from a reading of the Fifth Amendment that says property cannot be taken from people without due process of law. So the Missouri Compromise, unconstitutional. You can't prevent people from taking their property to territories in the West. You can't create a line and say slavery can't exist north of that because that's preventing people of the right of their property. The property that they have, enslaved people, must be protected. This case is essentially reading the Constitution as a pro-slavery document, and it causes many Northerners to wonder well, if property can't be taken without due process, does that mean the North can't ban slavery? It sets up a really, really divisive debate about what the Constitution even means with regards to slavery. So we can see our third theme is that Northerners are aggressively not just saying slavery should be protected in the South, and we're fine with that, they're pushing the argument that slavery goes everywhere. Um, so here's the map showing the location of Kansas. You can see Kansas right here and Nebraska. Notice it is north of the Missouri Compromise line. So technically there should be no slavery up here in Kansas, but the Kansas-Nebraska Act overturns that and allows the people of Kansas to vote on it, setting up the situation that creates bleeding Kansas, uh, which is mostly limited to this area over here, particularly when pro-slavery Missourians keep crossing the border and attacking um, and killing people and burning towns, voting multiple times in elections um, fraudulently. So you want to talk real voter fraud, definitely Kansas. The architect of the Kansas-Nebraska Act is Stephen Douglas, the little giant, an alcoholic senator from Illinois, um, who has a very interesting statue of him um, in the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. So I took this picture of the statue, uh, quite a little fascinating, movable structure. It actually, the arms move. 
Douglas and other Democrats are accused essentially of shoving slavery down the throats of the people of Kansas and in the West. So this cartoonist is depicting um, the pro-slavery Kansas Nebraska Nebraska Act as essentially murder. I'm being murdered as I'm being forced to accept slavery in the West. All these people on the Kansas Nebraska platform here are prominent Democrats. Kansas uh, quickly turned into a bloodbath. There were attacks. Um, most of them are actually attacks by pro slavery forces. So, this is a place where we can't say, well, there were bad people on both sides, um, which is a terrible argument to make when the two sides are not equal. So you, you got to be careful here not to make equivalents when there aren't equivalents. Um, the pro-slavery forces definitely were doing the bulk of the damage. The retaliation by anti-slavery forces came in the form of this guy right here, John Brown, who with his sons uh, went out by night and attacked pro-slavery folks and murdered them in the attacks at Pottawatomie Creek. He will come back, so hold on to him. The Brooks Sumner Affair got depicted in several cartoons. Um, you can see here the cartoonist has made you more sympathetic for Sumner. Oh, poor guy. Oh, his head cracked open. You can see the cracks in it. He's got a pen. You know, he's got to be smart, and he's a thinker. He's sensitive. Um, he's defending himself you know, against this faceless brute with the cane who is just whacking the absolute snot out of him. Um, and this is pretty much how it happened. Sumner was at his desk and he couldn't get up to defend himself um, from the attack. So it was a pretty cowardly thing to do, uh, this, this Southerner attacking Charles Sumner. Another uh, cartoon of the same thing. Uh, this time, more sympathy for Sumner. Brooks is displayed as a brute. Um, Beecher, uh, the famous preacher, uh, Henry Ward, said the symbol of the North is the pen, intellect smart. The symbol of the South is the bludgeon. <laughs> They're brutes. Here is uh, Dred Scott. Uh, who sued in the famous Dred Scott case. Uh, he and his wife taken to the North and they asked the question, does being in free soil make us free? According to the Supreme Court and Roger Brooke Taney with his face looking kind of melted here, um, the answer to that question is no. Uh, free soil does not make you free any more than sitting in your garage makes you a car. Um, eventually, though, Scott and his wife would be freed, but they would die not too long after their freedom. So here's our conclusion to this shortened lecture. By the brink of the Civil War, the political system and the Constitution can no longer contain the dissent over slavery. The country is pulling apart at the seams and the parties cannot bridge the divide, our constitution cannot bridge the divide. As the two diametrically opposed foes, sections of the country stood at the brink and on the eve of this dissolution of our government, four candidates for president will address the nation and its troubled future. Those four candidates will be the subject of the next lecture as we see the union being ripped apart. That's it for our shortened version of lecture 13. Catch you next time for the Civil War itself.